And it's a real privilege today to have on the guest line Terry Lee Torok, award-winning creative strategist and an expert in innovative entertainment technology. Terry has been the architect for a, a variety of high-profile events. He won a Clio Award for the Polaroid Mall Tour and received an Ad Age Promotion of the Year Award for both the MTV Museum of Unnatural History and the Nintendo World Championships Mall Tour. Terry, welcome to the Brian and Lee Show. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Lee, and thank you for reminding me of those things. <laughs> I forgot <laughs> well, yeah. all about it. Yeah. A lot of them I didn't even know about because uh, we're going to be talking about this in the interview later, but I only knew you for uh, Video Power. It was a one-year uh, one year wonder, I guess. It was a, a video game competition that was on in syndication, and that was um, quite a show itself, wasn't it? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a great year. It ran a couple of years in a, in a couple of different markets, but uh, about 97% of the U.S. daily, and then thereafter, I always knew where we were running because we would get these crazy loads of fan mail from places like South Africa and the Middle East and Asian countries, so I guess it had a couple of year runs after that, but yeah. uh, one year was just fine for me. That was that was good. Yeah, absolutely. So what turned you on into the entertainment industry? Well, it's funny. Um, Brian's kind of a full circle. I actually grew up with a uh, desire to you know, share stories and join the Peace Corps and work for Nat Geo and ended up at slightly after college, um, you know, through a, a winding yellow brick road. Uh, serious journalism kind of got pulled into the big sway of how much share of voice entertainment really had. So while I was, you know, for a while working for an ABC affiliate and I was a news director, I had a lot of friends coming out of college that were having a lot more fun and that they were getting, you know, bigger audiences. So somewhere in there I got, um, I spent some time in, in a variety of entertainment projects and I got recruited by MTV to do a, a really fun tour and go out on the road for a couple of years because this crazy thing called the MTV Museum of Unnatural History. And from there it led to lots of, really fun and odd tours but you know year to year it was anything from Sprint and the Rolling Stones and Citibank and Elton John to um, Phil Collins and Sears so a lot of um, entertainment marketing and then kind of was able more lately to come full circle where I've, I've been able to spend after 9-11 a lot more time working with uh, humanity and things that um, touch a little deeper and and uh, kind of, it's a chance for me to come full circle. So that's what I've been doing lately. I have to say, Terry, you have a broadcaster's voice. You really do. This is Lee. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thanks, Lee. I, I'm getting it from you, so, so thank you. I, I, to be honest with you, and it was um, spend some time, and, and I was actually on video, when, it was during Video Power, when I was like, hey, wait a minute. The guy who's doing the voiceovers, the bumpers, was getting paid a lot more than me, and it was such an easy and fun job. I'm like, I want some of that. So yeah, yeah. I ended up spending a little time and um, and uh, you know spending some time in the in the voice business, but more for fun. I didn't take it seriously, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Well, that is good. But also, uh, a lot of these things I didn't even know that uh, happened was uh, the Polaroid Mall tour. Can you give us a little bit about uh, what that was? Well, as you had mentioned, uh, we did win a Clio, but who knows what Polaroid is anymore. <laughs> so it's it's funny, you know, um, I was actually working, you know, fresh out of college, a really fun kind of summer job at a place called Marine World Africa, USA, which now I think is a Six Flags up in Vallejo, California. And we were doing crazy shows, whales, dolphins, you know, water ski stunt shows and an agency called Footcone and Belding, um, now Footcone, um, caught me in the act and said, wow, we're putting together a, an idea for Polaroid. Would you consider you know, helping us out? So I spent some time with them and we arrived at this idea of how of traveling around the country and teaching young people how to make their own commercials. So it was the first campaign for, by, and about kids. And it was really cool because traveling around we would um, go show, you know, just give kids the tools and the trade and say, hey, make your own message. 
and it ended up winning a couple of Clio's, which was fun. And from there, um, funny enough, caught the attention of MTV, who said, "Hey, you know, we'd love to have you design or be part of a tour." They flew me out to New York, and I interviewed. It was my first time in New York City. I was living on the West Coast at the time, originally a Midwestern boy. And they, um, you know, I was there, and I was like, "Man, I don't know if you guys are trying to." interview me or intimidate me, but you're, you're not doing either, and I, I really don't want this job. I'd just fallen in love, I was living in San Francisco, everything was good, um, and lo and behold, I think they thought I was negotiating. Oh, man. So <laughs> they made me another <laughs> offer, and uh, I thought, you know, what the heck, um, great opportunity, so that that thing, the MTV Museum of Financial History, won a couple of awards as well, and that led to something called the Nintendo World Championships. So for a lot of listeners that don't know, at those heyday, you know, of Nintendo on the rise, there was this great concern that, hey, my kid is locked in the bedroom playing Nintendo all day. Uh, I remember sitting on, you know, a set of a TV show in the green room, and I was also the Nintendo spokesperson for that year Mm -hmm. and that tour. And sitting in the green room in South Carolina, and I'm watching the bumper, and it says, SAT scores are down, Nintendo is to blame, Terry Torek up next. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Now, listen, man, it's like 5 o'clock on a Sunday morning, and I'm like, okay, I think I ought to wake up for this one. I think so. So where did the idea of the uh, championship come from? The reason why I ask this is because the uh, year before this tournament, uh, the movie The Wizard came out. And everybody in the video game community is uh, speculating that that's where the idea came from. Yeah, it was actually a a reverse of that because we had the tour designed and we were out with the tour. um, And there was a lot of amazing coincidences between our tour and the Wizard. You know, same look and feel, same stage design and idea. Um, It was purely coincidental and it was because of the rise of Nintendo. So... You know, in, in, in responding to, oh my gosh, you know, what's going to go wrong with my kid if he's stuck in, in video games? And we took a serious look at that and said, we got to get this thing out of the bedroom, out of the living room, off the couch, and onto a big stage where parents can get involved, where we can look at these young people playing and think about them more like focusing on them and their... Um, You know, their personalities, of course, like you would an Olympic champion. It was a lot more fun to focus on them. So so during that year of the Nintendo World Championships, I said, wow, this thing is, you know, I can't can't believe it. We were like sold out crowds and tens of thousands of people in the audience watching a kid stand there with a controller in his hand, stare at a screen. I'm like, how how exciting (laughs) can that be? But we made it exciting. We engaged the audience. We talked about the nuances, the orientation towards individual achievement. We talked about, you know, these are the future Bill Gates of the world Mm -hmm. and um, design technology. So uh, during that year is when I started to write a TV show Mm. uh, idea. And we basically were on the road every, I think, 50 weeks out of that year. So I was able to work out a live show on stage Mm -hmm. that in essence, in addition to our competitions, became this game show idea. Mm -hmm. So by the end of the tour, we had paid off the finals at, uh, we were in Hollywood at the, yeah, Universal Studios Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So I had invited a couple of producers and folks to to watch it Mm -hmm. and went back to New York and had a couple of people, you know, know about the pitch. Now, I hadn't delved into TV or produced TV at the time, even though I worked for an ABC affiliate short, you know, for a brief amount of time. Mm-hmm. So by the time I got to New York and pitched it, um, at the time Nickelodeon was starting up about it, they had heard about it, and they proceeded to try to get their own on the air, but we beat them. Um, mm-hmm. We got that thing. We got a hundred and a little over a hundred episodes written Produced from February to putting it on the end September, which for television is amazing in record time, um, especially for a guy like me who mm-hmm. hadn't really produced TV before. <laughs> I remember this yeah. guy by the name of Alan Bobots. I, 
all right, I want to I want to do a show. You know, here's your office. I have this big office and. <laughs> Corner office in Madison. Mm. I have, and I, I called the only friend I knew from MTV, Steve Trikas, and said, "Hey, man, oh, yeah. you're hired. Hire all your friends. Have your friends yeah. hire their friends. Bring a bunch of people here tomorrow. I got to yeah. produce this TV show." <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> Steve. That was he, the beginning. Yeah, Steve. He did an amazing job. I know him from uh, MTV's Remote Control, and he just, um, you know, like just about anything he uh, taps on that keyboard is just sounds like magic. I was. I've been really inspired by Steve. I, I still stay in touch. This you just tapped a, a point that I actually had to reach out to him and talk to him for a while. He lives up in Woodstock, but he taught me about you know his love and design of music. First of all, he could sit down and play classical piano like nobody's business, um, and for an audience of one or none, yeah, mm. fantastic. And he also had this ability to zoom in to nanoseconds of music and design these really intricate sounds within a matter of, you know, like you could open up one second of music and he had all kinds of different sound bites in there. So, yeah, really incredible guy. Very, in, I was very inspired by working with him. You bet. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what's, it, what's it like doing the live show? And uh, Because it's not scripted, I would think, and, and every show is, uh, is different. Yeah, you know, Thankfully, you know, part of so so video power was partially scripted, and you know you could tell by how smart Johnny Arcade was. Yeah, that's <laughs> Somehow true. Somehow he magically knew every answer to every question. Um, but I chose personally not to be scripted because I just didn't. I enjoyed improv. I enjoyed zooming in on the audience. I enjoyed the humor of the moment, um, the spontaneity, and it was a lot of fun. So we had a little bit of. We knew where we were going somehow, so we were semi-scripted, uh, but my parts, I just chose to just be in the moment. We did four shows a day in front of a live audience, so we were jamming yeah. at the Kaufman Astoria Studios. Oh um, at the time, the Cosby Show was running downstairs, and that was about it because New York was on a massive strike that year, so we we were one of the few shows running, and so was the Cosby Show. Mm, did not know that. Ooh. And... Um, now, I'm assuming that uh, you don't just pay the fee and then you're automatically up on stage. I'm assuming there was a qualifier. How did that work? So, um, mixing metaphor, which we're talking about video power or... Uh, well, first the uh, Nintendo World Championships, but uh, also um, I, w I do want to know the uh, contestant uh, testing for video power because I was, you know, it seems like uh, you just go into the audience and uh, you pick contestants at random. That's obviously not how it worked. Right, so... The, first of all, the Nintendo, there was a lot of similarities because we worked on the show thanks to the Nintendo World Championships, which was a general admission to get in. And then there was, um, I think, a fee to play every round, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. which was amazing because it, it seems like legalized gambling for kids at the time, honestly, when you look yeah. at it. <laughs> um, it was it was quite amazing. And, they you know, the, the idea was that it wasn't a get game of chance it was a game of skill but in any case on on tv yeah you want to do a little bit of um you know pre-picking uh a these are minors so you needed to get permissions anyway um, mm -hmm. so you know we did some pre-casting but then we allowed four to six of them to be in the audience and then had a chance to choose from them so there was a a smaller group that was pre-selected okay. and then from that live on the air we sub-selected um, our, our candidates to be on the show. That's right. And also, back to uh, the Nintendo World Championship, and uh, again, another similarity was the uh, time limit. Um, you had uh, 6 minutes and 21 seconds to get 50 coins on Super Mario Brothers, finish the first course of Rad Racer, and then just rack up points on Tetris. Uh, where, right. did, where did that uh, time limit come from, 6 minutes and 21 seconds? Yeah, so, funny you should ask, the um, the actual time was six minutes and twenty seconds, and a friend of mine from Philly was the Chris Rossi was sort of the technical director of the show, and I go, hey Chris, you know what the the time of six minutes and twenty seconds sitting up there on a the clock, how this doesn't look right, doesn't look cool. Do you mind adding a second? He goes, oh yeah, sure, we can add a second. I go six twenty one. That just looks cool. <laughs> six twenty one, six minutes and twenty one seconds of intense action. That became like a first line of of the competition. 
But what's really intriguing about this, and I still to this day don't see video games onto this, that time limit was a function of how much attention span that we could put an audience around, making sure that we could turn um, competitors through. But that turned out to be the exciting point of it. And I still don't think video games have capitalized in competitions how cool it is to have a timed event where you can recycle and enter and enter. And that really became the gripping point of the audience, leaning in, especially when it came down to Tetris and the whole audience, you know, is that Tetris wall build up. You had the whole audience, Tetris, boom! boom. You know, <laughs> we had the whole audience leaning in, parents, mm -hmm. kids, and everybody was playing along. So that time increment became more and more important. And in fact, it influenced a lot of um, competitions that I've done and some of the work that I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. And now I didn't, eat, again, I was ashamed to admit that I did not even know about this competition when it happened, nor did I know that the competition cartridge was given away as prizes, and now they command a ridiculous amount of money on eBay. <laughs> well, you yeah. didn't know. Holy cow, I was thinking about, wait, <laughs> yeah. a box of those bad boys sure. in storage somewhere. Yeah. And somebody shot it to me. He's like, hey, did you know these are going to, like, 20 grand on eBay. I'm like, wait a minute, I think I got a box of them somewhere. <laughs> I'm still trying to find them, so maybe I'll, I'll uh, put up a, a competition to find the box of... Well, if you have uh, enough of them, would you mind uh, giving me a uh, copy just for being on the show? <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to. you got to help me find the box. It's going to be a big search. Yeah, I believe it. But also, um, in uh, Video Power, it was uh, two minutes and two seconds during the first gameplay, and then one minute and one second. Was that the same principle, just like it just seemed cooler? Yeah, yeah, but plus, yeah, one minute, 101 is funner to say than, you know, um, and it's calculated. It, 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 I guess, inspired you to ask the question, why 101? Mm -hmm. If it was a minute, would it have been memorable? And I find that to be true to this day. And I actually take it to lesson, and I talk to a lot of people about it, is if I ask you, hey, do you have 22 minutes? Would you, can we have a conversation? Could I get time on your calendar for 22 minutes? It inspires a couple of things. It's like, wait, why 22 minutes? It allows person to think, wow, this person at least is respectful of my time, thought about it, and is calculating the time. And some of it came out of, you know, media, you know, we, we come up with these funny increments of time, but when you come up with an odd increment and make it important, then you actually pay attention to it and respect it. Absolutely. And also, uh, from the footage that I've seen on uh, YouTube, there was uh, quite a few times where you said, uh, we're looking for our champion to send to uh, Orlando, Florida, and then the finals wound up being in L.A. Why was that changed? Uh, you know too much, man. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, I guess snap my memory here. We knew that we were going to have our finals at Universal Studios. Mm. And I believe we it was a matter of working out which was more practical, Universal Studios, Florida, or Hollywood. And at the end, it was just, it just worked out. So yeah. I didn't i would have never remembered that had you not brought it up but yeah. there's the answer oh well that's all right what what makes you uh if, if you have not you said you were not a producer in tv what gives you the confidence to go in and say i'm going to produce a tv show ignorance <laughs> yes. Well, okay. Uh, that's how I got on the air. Okay. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> it was bliss, man. I, yeah. I just, you yeah. know, everything was working. You know, we would try stuff, work it out, work it through. And quite frankly, how many TV shows were road tested, you know, in front of live audiences of thousands of people. So it felt pretty good. It had a lot of momentum. Um, confident without being cocky, but feeling rather assured of myself. And, and I'm like... You know, now when I think about TV, I'm like, wow, it's so hard to pitch a show. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't know, you know, and it was fun. I mean, I walked into um, one of the, the producer's office, a giant corner office, and I noticed he had a basketball hoop, and he wasn't showing up for a while, so I just started shooting buckets and waiting on him, and then I just started to walk out because I thought this guy ain't going to show up. So mm. 
it, you know, I didn't know the whole protocol of, you know, sitting in somebody's office forever waiting. And I just, I was just a young guy with a lot of trajectory and energy and excitement. And that's still how I approach life. Do, do you think there's more opportunities out there with the expansion of uh, the Internet and Netflix and all these other uh, streaming services? Do you, do you think there's more opportunities to pitch shows? Yeah, 100%. And I think that there's a, a demand for more quality. So the more mm -hmm. volume and noise and buzz we have out there, the more we need to curate quality intriguing content i think it's a floodgate and while yep everybody with a camera an iphone or otherwise can capture content that doesn't mean it's great yeah. yeah so the more that we can qualify content i think is key and i think being respectful of the time and managing time increments is also important for people so i'm, I'm a tedster i go to ted and you know ted became you know part and part why ted became popular well curated but the increment of 18 minutes of time is also golden it's like hey i i can manage that mm -hmm. something in 18 minutes or less i've got that kind of time mm -hmm. so as i work on content and programming today and going forward i do think a lot about that time i think a lot about competition as well and competition as controversial as it might be for some is really a rich opportunity moving forward of not only entertaining, but entertaining change and doing something more important for this precious planet we live on. We have a, a question from a listener here, Chuck Donegan. He asks, uh, what's the funniest thing that you can remember that happened on Video Power? Oh, man. We had so... We had, like, crazy fun in Video Power. Um, I think... Funniest... Man, I mean, the whole the whole year was funny to me. The whole like, concept of, like, how is this possible we're doing this crazy game show that, that actually focuses on what could be the most boring thing, like watching paint dry, possible. Um, I just, I guess I love the idiocy of the whole thing that, you know, at the end we came up with this idea of a Velcro suit and kids running through this mini mall mm -hmm. and having to stick, stick stuff to their their um, self, I think one time, and then if you remember, they ran around this mall in 41 seconds, hello, not 40, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then when they got to the end of this tube, they would come down this tube with everything possible in their arms, stuck to their head, stuck to their body in their Velcro mm -hmm. suit, and whatever they came down with, I, live on the air, would say, wow, you got this, 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 and this, congratulations, mm -hmm. what a catch. So one time, when one of the kids who was a little slower on the take, um, a little bit more um, robust in size, uh, had it down the tube, and he didn't come out. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> so in one way, he was wildly successful because he had got a lots of cool stuff, and the other way, he got <laughs> stuck in the tube. So, you know, when you're uh, live yeah. tape, that's those are always kind of really mm -hmm. fun moments. And I have to say, that is the one reason why I kept watching. Uh, I kept getting up at 6.30 in the morning every day just to watch the show to uh, see my uh, childhood um, dream on screen is just running around the mall grabbing Nintendo games. Well, we would have all kinds of kids writing and saying, how can I possibly get on the show? And then when I would run into parents, they're like, oh, you're the guy. I had to hear you every morning at 6.30, 7 o'clock, whenever it ran at whatever market. So cursed by parents, loved by kids. Mm. Um, yeah, it was just fun, man. It was, it was really fun. There was a lot of levity and enjoyment. So thanks for the, uh, the question. But I have to say the whole thing was really pleasurable. And uh, I, think it, I think it also tipped, tipped me in a really fun direction of how we entertain change and how we can take a look at levity in our life um, and, and enjoyment, but, but actually do things that are a little bit more profound and, and important um, in today's world. Now the, um, well, almost forgot to ask, uh, did the uh, contestants receive their uh, prizes right away or was it after the show aired? Yeah, so they did receive their prizes right away. There were some, um, some exceptions where they were props on stage, so we had to had to ship them out. So I think there was 
uh, a little bit half and half that we mm-hmm. I'm just excited I can remember this that, that we had to sh- ship some of them out but we had a good staff that took care of that so yeah. but listen hey if there's any listeners out there that didn't get their prize um, <laughs> I'm sorry man I probably wasn't my part of the gig now the Nintendo World Championships and uh, Power Fest was wildly successful I think everybody at the time thought it was going to be a yearly event do you have any idea why it only lasted the one year you know, it's funny, uh, we as the producers, and this, this is true, the TV show, the tours that I did, we had this sort of like, we were ready to do the next next. Us as producers, we were ready just to go on and do other things, um, tours and music and, you know, whatever was next. So I think a lot of us had, from a producing standpoint, had short attention span. We actually... Some of us moved on to some animation, other TV shows, other tours. So I'm not sure that we personally had the drive. I do know that last year they had a um, an anniversary of the Nintendo World Championships, and there's never been one at that size and scale. So I don't have the full answer. It might have been that us personally didn't have that, you know, super drive. I wouldn't. Nobody wanted to do it for a bunch of years. We're mm-hmm. like, let's do the next thing. And did you see that um, tournament last year on uh, live stream? You know, I, um, somebody shot me a little bit of the highlights, and um, I don't know. What did you think? Did you see it? I did see it. Uh, I'd almost forgotten about it, and then I got an email about it, and I turned it on. And it was a lot of fun. It was just like a uh, live stage uh, game show. The problem I had... This is one of the things that uh, happens sometimes where something um, looks good on paper, but it doesn't go well on stage. During Splatoon, they had uh, somebody's nine-year-old son um, com- or commentate on the game, and it just sounded horrible. Yeah. I um, The little pieces I saw um, was a little um, raw, and, and not that it needed to be rehearsed, but... You know, we had this crazy advantage of having live audiences day after day after day, um, show after show after show. So, you know, we were able to refine stuff and be a lot more and actually be less rehearsed. We knew where we were going. We were on time. There was, you know, again, being respectful of time so that the audience themselves can manage time. I think it's just it's just helpful. It's just more... Um, it's actually more produced without looking or feeling more produced. And it allows for spontaneity and levity. And, you know, we had a lot of special guests. I think about all the the celebrities at the time that had joined us, you know, from Stallone's kid to Stallone to, to I don't know, there's all the kids, in, you know, 90210. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's a whole cast of shows that, that came out to join us because we did these quick spurts of energy that I think were a lot of fun. We didn't take ourselves too seriously at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that I think that was helpful, you know. And yeah. I, I think there's opportunities to do things like it now. I, I enjoy what I'm doing, which is mm-hmm. a different kind of competition now. Um, and if we got time, I'll tell you about it. Yeah, please do. So I've, um, you know, since 9-11, I've spent a lot of time on the ground in places from, you know, you name it, from Darfur refugee camps to working with child soldiers in northern Uganda, um, working in uh, South Africa and after school programs and been able to do a tribute for Matt Damon and save the children and um, some content for George Clooney. And, and, and that so all good and fine. What I did enjoy is really getting into the depths of humanity and complexity of challenges and problems. But I stumbled along this amazing organization called Enactus, E-N-A-C-T-U-S dot org. And at Enactus, they have competitions on stages across 36 countries where college students go out into the world from their community or any community in the far corners of the world and create sustainable business projects with the intent of helping and advancing humanity, people, planet, and prosperity. Mm. And they bring these ideas to stage throughout these 36 countries 
in 17-minute presentations that are dynamic, inspiring, mind-blowing, powerful. And then all 36 of these countries then compete in one World Cup. Last year it was in Johannesburg. The year prior it was in Beijing. This year coming up in September, it will be in Toronto. So I was blown away by this organization. Deeply inspired. Love the idea of youth competing. Love the idea of entertaining change. Love the way that the competition ran. In this case, it wasn't against each other. It was for each other. So it's a competition where we all win. It's as equally as exciting, powerful, meaningful, and I love the organization. So I was asked to, to join it, and um, I did. I'm in my sophomore year at the organization. I, I get to be the chief innovation officer, which is a lot of fun, uh, which sometimes means just get out of the way and nurture the innovation that, that these young minds have created. So that, to me, is respect for time in a way that only entrepreneurs you know, entrepreneurial minds and spirits can appreciate and understand, uh, and yet we have these competitions for humankind. Absolutely. Can, can you uh, can you give us a, an example of one of the projects? Or uh... surely, yeah. Uh, so most of these teams that range from any where from ten in a team to one hundred and ten in a team across the U.S. and these countries uh, range from creating one dollar glasses for uh, the impoverished to create jobs a uh, project out of Tennessee called Springback where they identified the opportunity to recycle mattresses into um, materials that matter um, and along the way employ um, formerly incarcerated one of my favorites was college students in Ireland who identified the need to, much like an Airbnb for college students, but more long-term, having a quiet space in place to work as an alternative to a dorm so that they could focus on their studies. And in doing so, matched it up with um, elderly folks who had empty rooms and were suffering from loneliness. So mm. that was an amazing match this year um, the team that won out of the United Kingdom took something that could be as stigmatic and unspoken and um, detrimental for young women who drop out of school because they have their menstrual cycles and there's no clean facilities, there's no opportunity. So they had a way to remove the stigma, um, actually make it fashionable and conversational for both young boys and for young girls. So they would no longer drop out of school. They would have um, a clean uh, facilities and opportunities. And all of these create new job opportunities. So the idea is a sustainable job comes out of it. So either the college students set it up for a community and fade themselves, or it's a legacy program where they stay in as advisors mm -hmm. and build it out. So they've tackled some really tough areas from malaria to poverty to unemployment to um, primarily entrepreneurial action and social enterprises. So, yeah, it's called enactus.org. I, I encourage anybody to please check it out. And the new competitions are cool. Um, they're within 17 minutes, and we're creating shorter ones, and we're creating 22-minute mentors and a 77-second film festival. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's, here, here come the numbers again, man. Yeah, yeah, it's, how cool is it, though? It sounds... Really say, you know, hey, we love our sports, man. You know, we lean in and yeah. watch every kind of sports, but where is there a stage for the human race? Yeah, Where absolutely. do we get to be glued to content that's like, wow, this is tight competition. It's intense. It's inspiring. And it's one of those that when they... The first one to hit the finish line isn't finished until they look back and carry over everybody else to the finish line. So I love this kind of competition. I think Enactus is uh, spectacular, it's exciting, it's youthful, it's really fresh. It sounds so cool, and uh, I'm gonna go on the website and learn more about it, uh, uh, because uh, you, you, 
you know, everyone talks about how society is not doing enough and, and the problems that society has, and, and we certainly do. But uh, when you have an example like this, an organization like this that's doing uh, so much good, um, we, 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 should, we should support it. And I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Lee. You know, there are ways, even in our entertainment, and we all need to escape, you know. Sure. <laughs> working with video games over the past and game shows and MTV and this and that, there's no doubt that entertainment is a powerful tool. And I think that we should be able to celebrate change. It doesn't mean that, you know, it can't be fun, we can't enjoy ourselves. I think we can, and I think we can bring it to a more of a world stage where we can have our fun and really help and invite and in make change happen and invite other young people to, um, you know, celebrate them, get, in, get involved and get engaged. I agree. I agree a thousand percent. Now, um, you said uh, earlier in the interview that uh, you uh, wanted to uh, become kind of like an announcer bumper guy. I'm going to give you a shot if you'd like that. <laughs> what do you got, man? Okay. Uh, would you mind uh, doing a bumper for our show? Here we go. All right. I'll give you a uh, cue. Three, two. How many takes do I get on this? <laughs> um, we'll give you up to two takes. Is that okay? Uh, two takes. Gee. Okay. Go. Oh, just go. I thought it was. Yeah. Oh, come on, come we got to look Okay. Down. Okay. Down. I'm, I'm sorry. Three. Oh, yeah, we, we got call letters or something. Yeah. Or, uh, WNJC 1360, uh, you're listening to the Brian and Lee Show, the only father-son team on radio. Okay. When it comes to the father and son team, you got to listen to Brian and Lee. It's the only way to go. They entertain some of the coolest things from the past to the future to right now. So tune in, WNJC. Awesome. Awesome. That's, a, that, that's, that's one a, take. That's one take. That's one take. We got it. That's, that's terrific. Yeah, I was hoping I get the letters right, but that I, I, I do. They are memorable. And you guys are memorable. I, I love what you guys are doing. And I have to Thank say, you. I really admire um, the whole father-son scene. You know, I have, a, I have two beautiful boys. They serve as my pillars, Justice and Elijah. And... You know, at the time I was doing video power and all those fun things, I'm like, man, you know, by the time I have kids, they're not going to remember any of this stuff. You know, I hope I can do something memorable. So what you're doing is absolutely, you know, beautiful. And God bless you guys for working together. How cool is that? Oh, thank you so much. And I also want to make sure I don't forget to say this. Thank you for making Tetris sound so exciting. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was great. Well, thank you, guys. And, uh, you know, I have um, two beautiful boys that I hope, you know, they'll, they have two very different beautiful paths. They serve as my pillar, and, and you guys are inspiring. So Thank you. Um, thank you so thank much. You so I much. really appreciate it. I, I hope someday you get a chance to work with your sons. It, it, is, it is quite a... Quite an interesting, uh, you know, it really bonds you and, and brings you closer together. So uh, I, I, my wish for you is that someday you, uh, you get that chance. Well, thank you. And what you're making important is conversations and storytelling. You know, I'm, I'm happy to be lucky at this moment. I'm at a rooftop uh, at Venice Beach, and it's a beautiful day. But as you really look, walk, pe watch people on the boardwalk, most of them are, you know, stuck into their cell phones. Not that I'm not at the moment. But, <laughs> you know, to pick your head up, to look at the world today, to breathe a little bit yep. and get into a, a little bit deeper conversation, who knew it would be such um, a relic and a gift and an opportunity. So anytime we can connect cross generations together, and have a deeper, meaningful conversation and entertain change, it's all good. Marvelous. Thank you so much, Terry. And uh, if anything uh, ever comes up again in the future you'd like to uh, talk about it on our program, uh, please give us a buzz. We'd love to have you back here. Beautiful. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Terry.